you will hear a telephone conversation between an employee at a pet insurance company and a customer. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 6. Pet Protect UK, how can I help? Oh, hello there. I'm calling to inquire about your pet insurance plans. Of course. Just give me a second, please. Sure. So, have you checked our website already to see the options we offer? I've had a quick glance, and I think I'm interested in the basic plan. Great. I need to just ask a few questions first, then. Is your pet a dog, a cat, or a rabbit? It's a dog. And is it a puppy or...? No, he's three years old. Right. May I ask, has your dog been insured before? I just adopted him from the rescue centre last week, and I think he'd been there a while, so I doubt it. OK, so you've had him for a week then? That's correct. Great. I apologise for asking this, but your dog... What's his name, by the way? Fenton. Fenton. Is that spelt with an F? Yeah. F-E-N-T-O-N. -N. Great. Thank you for that. So, according to the Rescue Centre, has Fenton ever attacked, bitten, or been aggressive towards a person or another animal? No, not at all. Excellent. And is he a guide dog, or...? No, just a house pet. Great. And you said he's three years old. Do you know the exact date of birth? Oh, yes. It's on the adoption certificate. Just give me a sec. Um... It's May 19th, 2013. And do you know, has Fenton been neutered? Yes, he's been castrated. Excellent. And final question. What type of dog is Fenton? Is he a pedigree, a crossbreed or a mixed breed? A uh, crossbreed, I think. Right. A uh, crossbreed... Wait, sorry. What's the difference between the three? A pedigree is a dog whose parents are of the same breed... A crossbreed is from two different breeds, while a mixed breed is three or more. Then he's a mixed breed. Sorry about that. Right, no worries. So, could I take your full name, please? My name is Peter Pishinger. That's P-I-S-C-H-I-N-G-E-R. Right, thank you for that. And what's your address? That's 27 Cherry Drive, NW8 3HD. 3 H D and finally a telephone number please zero two zero three six three four seven nine five seven thank you you now have thirty seconds to look at questions seven to ten Now, you said you were interested in the basic plan. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. May I ask, are you planning to switch insurance providers after the first year of your pet insurance, or is there a possibility you might renew with us? I haven't really thought about it. Why? The reason I'm asking is because if you plan to renew with us, it might be worth considering our premium or ultimate premium plan. With the basic plan, you will have to pay the same fee of £8 per month regardless of how long you stay with us. If you choose one of our other two plans, though, you will receive a discount for the first six months. You'll only have to pay £12 for premium and £15 for ultimate. And then, depending on your circumstances, you might be eligible for further discounts after your first year, depending on how many expenses you claim. If you claim less than £300, you'll have to pay the same as for the basic plan, but receive the cover provided by the premium plan. Huh. 
Is that something you might be interested in? I'll have to think about it. Is it possible to switch to one of the other plans later on? Yes, of course. You can always upgrade. Let's stick to the basic plan for now then, and then I might call you back to switch. No problem. So, what happens now? Well, first we would need you to come over with little Fenton so we can have a look at his documents and medical history. We'd also need you to get him to the vet for a quick checkup. All of this is standard procedure before we can proceed with the insurance plan. And then, when all that's done, you can either set up a direct debit in person or you can call us back and do it over the phone. Right. And the basic plan will cover... Well, the basic plan covers veterinary fees, obviously, plus a few more things such as boarding costs, loss by theft or straying, advertising and reward, death by accident or illness. You can find a comprehensive list on our website, or I could forward it to you via email if you prefer. Thanks. I'll check the website. No problem. So, shall we book you an appointment so you can come over? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, Clark Cycle Hire. My name's Keith. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I saw your ad in the local paper, and as I'm thinking of doing some cycling, I'm wondering what kinds of bike you have and what your prices are like. Well, we hire out two main types of machine, touring and mountain bikes. Are you likely to be riding off-road, do you think? No, I'll probably be sticking to roads and country lanes, so a touring bike would be best, I think. Right, well, the rate will be £50 for a week or £14 per day. So it's a lot cheaper to rent by the week? Yes, definitely. Though it's important to bring the bike back on time, otherwise I'm afraid we have to charge a late return fee. And how much is that? For each additional hour, it's £1.25. So... If you were a day late, it would cost another £30. Yes, that's right. I'd make sure I didn't do that then. I should also point out there's a deposit which you get back when you return the bicycle. In good condition, of course. On touring models, it's £60. Is there anything else I'd have to pay? No, that's it. Though if you're planning to ride fairly long distances, you might like to have one or two accessories. Such as? Well, for another £5, we can supply lightweight bags, either panniers or the handlebar sort. It's amazing how much they can carry, and the way they're designed means they don't get in the way when you're riding. Well, I'll see. But what about essential things like a pump and a repair kit? I wouldn't have to pay extra for those, would I? No, no, no. There's no charge for things like that. Or for a lock. It's a good strong one, too. Just make sure you don't lose the key. That reminds me, what about insurance? What happens if someone steals the bike, in spite of the wonderful lock? Didn't I mention that? Oh, I, I should have told you that's included in the rental too. And it covers everything, does it? Uh, it covers you against theft of the bike, yes. As long as it's securely locked at the time. You'd have to pay part of any individual claim, though. How much? If the bike was stolen and not recovered, you'd be liable for the first £100. Hmm, so, if I do go ahead and rent one, how do I pay? By cheque or would it have to be cash? 
Uh, neither, I'm afraid. We can only accept credit card bookings. Otherwise, we'd have to ask our customers for the full value of the machine as a deposit. I've got a visa in my name. Would that be OK? Sure. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. So if I want to have a look at the bikes, how do I find you? I live near the university, by the way. Right. First you take Woods Road as far as the main police station. I know it. It's right next to the park. Yes, that's it. And after the police station, there's a turning to the right called Oak Street. At the big supermarket? Uh, no, it's before then. It's actually between the police station and a garage on the other side. OK. So, you go down Oak Street until you reach the health centre on the right. If you get to a pub called the Maple Leaf, you've gone too far. All right? Yes, I've got that. Now, opposite the health centre, there's a pharmacy, and we're just behind that. OK, fine. I'll try to call over sometime tomorrow. Great. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between three students who are preparing a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey, guys. Oh, hey, Gail. You made it. Yes, yeah, sorry. I was stuck at the library paying late fees. Have you guys started going through the data yet? Yeah, we've already collated it and we've started designing the graphs we're going to use in the presentation. Oh, really? That's fast. Well, anyway, here's what we've got so far. OK, so... Wow. 38% said they thought about quitting school in the first year. That's a huge number. Yeah, and only 10% said they were happy at school from beginning to end. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I thought the majority would be happy here. Well, just remember that about 30% of the school population are foreign students. And from the UK students, only 2% are actually from the area. So, I guess it makes sense that people would miss home. Yeah, but to want to actually quit school. Well, they didn't want to exactly, they just thought about it. OK, so how should we organise the presentation? What did you guys decide? Well, Kevin and I were saying that we should start by explaining what the topic of our research was and how we decided to collect the data. So... I'll start by saying that our topic was how first-year students felt a month after beginning school and how their attitudes progressed and changed by the end of the academic year. So then we were thinking that I should explain that the population we want to study was obviously first-year students, but because we need their complete experience from the beginning to the end of their first year, we'd have to actually poll students in their second and third year. And then we said that you should explain how we access the population. 
So I'll say that we got the permission from the school to go to different classes from different departments and hand out the surveys in paper form, right? Right. And that it took us about three weeks to complete this part of our research. So then we need to describe the three different areas of focus of our survey. So Lindsay can do that. Uh, say that the survey had three sections. The first one, asking just some general questions about the age, gender, nationality and field of study of each student. Then the second one, focused on how they felt in their first six months at school. And the third, how they felt in the summer after their first year was complete. That sounds good. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 26 to 30. OK, so let me see the breakdown. Uh, OK, so we've got an equal distribution of boys and girls. That's good. Almost equal. 51% of the participants were boys. The rest were girls. Right, and 70% of the participants were British, while the other 30% were... 10% were from America and Asia, 2% were from Africa, and 18% were European. We had a small number of Australians as well, 0.03%, so I guess Europeans were 17.97% if you want to be precise. Which we should. Anyway, and obviously the age was all 20 or 21, with a few 19-year-olds. Only about 5%. No, wait, 4%, right? No, it's 5%, look. Right, OK. So Lindsay will describe the three sections, and then you, Kevin, you'll describe the demographic and geographical breakdown, and I... Uh, you can start with the graph, and then we'll all explain the data together. Right. So we'll put this graph up on the board and explain that most students experience some form of homesickness or mild depression in the beginning of their course. But we need to point out that by the end of the year, it was only 5% that still felt like quitting school. Yeah, but remember that we didn't actually have the opportunity to interview or poll any of the students who left school, so the information we have only relates to current students, and those numbers might be bigger in reality. Yeah, I guess we need to mention that. But we did check the dropout rate for the last two years, and it was very low, so at the end of the day, the numbers can't be much bigger. Yeah. Anyway, so after we explain the data and we show the three graphs with the background information and the responses for six months and one year, we should spend some time also talking about... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about architecture. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 31 to 36.
During today's seminar, we will be looking at English Gothic architecture and its origins with a specific case study of Wells Cathedral in England. The Gothic style was initially brought over to England from France. This was at a period of time in which England was ruled from France by the Normans, starting with William the Conqueror, who first defeated the English army at the Battle of Hastings on October 14th, 1066. After 1072, when some smaller rebellions in northern England had been defeated, the Normans gained complete control of the English monarchy, which they controlled until 1154. The peace that ensued in England had a large impact on many aspects of daily life. Thousands of French words entered the English language for the first time, such as beef, fruit, city and hour. French ideas and styles, like Gothic, also began to flow across the channel to England too, examples of which can still be seen in the architecture of many listed buildings. A listed building is one that is protected from alteration or demolition because of its historical or stylistic importance. One such building is Wells Cathedral. Construction on Wells Cathedral began in 1175 at a time when Gothic architecture as a style was in its infancy. As a result, it is one of the first entirely Gothic buildings ever constructed. From the first design to the date it was completed in 1490, Gothic architecture flourished in England. Therefore, later additions to the building were still influenced by this Gothic style, rather than by later architectural styles such as Tudor architecture. Older cathedrals in England would have initially been influenced by Romanesque architecture, alternatively known as Norman architecture in England. As the former name suggests, Romanesque was a building style based on the skills passed on to various areas of Europe by the Romans. When the Western Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century, these methods were retained by Rome's former colonies and developed further. One such Roman gift to the Romanesque architects was the round arch, also known as the true arch. The Romans perfected this style by using wedge-shaped stones called voussoirs, which created pressure that held the structure together at the top. Cathedrals in England, such as the ones in Ely and Canterbury, were started before the arrival of Gothic architecture. Even though parts of those two cathedrals, which were constructed later, are in the Gothic style, other sections predating the arrival of Gothic architecture are Romanesque. The result is known as eclectic because the building is constructed using more than one style. All of these cathedrals belong to a group known as the Medieval Cathedrals of England. There are 26 different buildings that belong to this group in total, all of which were constructed or added to during a 500-year period from 1040 to 1540. The transition from Romanesque to Gothic began in 1144 at the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis on the edge of Paris. It was here that a Benedictine abbot by the name of Suger had just completed his plan to rebuild the Basilica of Saint-Denis in a new style through which he believed the dull mind rises to truth through that which is material. This refers to one architectural feature in particular high, rib-vault ceilings which created much more space inside the cathedral and were designed to draw the attention of people up towards heaven. This design feature also allowed whole walls of the cathedral to be transformed by colourful stained glass. Work started on Wells Cathedral soon afterwards, greatly inspired by Abbot Suger's work. Planned in the crucifix style with the head pointing east and foot pointing west, the cathedral is 126 metres long and the nave is 20 metres high. 
This is quite low compared to some of the bigger cathedrals elsewhere. Use of tracery, lancet windows and mullions are all characteristic of English Gothic architecture. Whilst examples of all three of these architectural elements can be found at Wells, the lancet windows have no tracery at all, which was more common in early English Gothic architecture before advances were made in the use of mullions and tracery with glass. Lancet windows are tall, thin windows with a pointed arch at the top and are so named because they resemble the weapon often carried by a soldier called a lance. Examples of these lancet windows can be seen on the west front of the cathedral, which is the most celebrated for its life-size sculptures and delicate floral carvings. Inside the pinnacle-topped gable is a sculpture of Christ the Judge. Immediately below him, sculptures of the Twelve Apostles peer out over the small city of Wells. Below the Apostles are nine archangels, which are half-size sculptures. At one time, all of these, along with the decorative carvings, would have been painted and gilded. However, today, all the paint has worn away and the sculptures are the colour of the oolite sedimentary stone used to construct the cathedral. It is remarkable to think that more than 800 years ago, such magnificent buildings were created without the use of large cranes and modern technology. It would have taken much longer but it is possible to see the high level of craftsmanship and attention to detail that is less common in the modern day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.